Hi, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Um, thanks for coming to our talk. So, my name is Gustav Petaki, and I'm a consultant neonatologist in Cambridge, and this is David Jong, who is a medical student in Cambridge. And in the next 20 25 minutes, we are going to talk about how we've been using Python to look at the data which uh, I, and we've been downloading from neonatal ventilators on our unit. So, as I said in my daytime job, I'm a baby doctor. Uh, I'm looking after critically uh, newborn babies, uh, working in Cambridge in Rosie Hospital, where uh, we have got roughly as a big neonatal unit, like a thousand admissions every year, uh, and that means thousand sick babies. Now, we do ventilate a lot, like around 1,500 days a year. So, but importantly, that doesn't mean that and every baby requires one or two days of ventilation. Actually, most of our babies don't require mechanical ventilation, fortunately, at all. But at the same time, sorry, sometimes it comes back. Uh, at the same time, um, some babies require weeks of ventilation, sometimes months of ventilation, causing quite a bit of lung damage to them. So it can be a challenge, actually, to take them off the ventilator eventually. So it's important, it's extremely important to uh, get mechanical ventilation right in my work. So, uh, if you look at the evolution of neonatal ventilators over the last 40 years, sorry, this sometimes comes and goes. So, if you look at the evolution of neonatal ventilators over the last 40 years, uh, there has been a huge progress. So, on the left side, you can see a ventilator which was in use in the late 70s, early 80s, and that's a completely mechanical device. It's got no electric supply. All it was able to do in inverted commas is to um, inflate the chest with some extra positive pressures and give some supplemental oxygen and save many babies' life at the time. Now, on the right side of the picture, we see a ventilator which is uh, more like the one which we use nowadays. And this ventilator knows and does a lot of things. And I think the problem actually with this ventilator is that it has become perhaps too complex for the busy clinicians to use it. So in, in the real life, we have so many other aspects of neonatal care. So the real-time waveforms on this ventilator, this pressure, flow, and volume waveforms, and the advanced modes, and the submenus and trends, which can be accessed by submenus, are actually very rarely looked at by clinicians. And because the data is not stored, uh, on, uh, on a high sampling rate, therefore most of this information is not used and lost. So you might ask, why is mechanical ventilation complex? And actually, mechanical ventilation is not complex at all if the baby is not breathing. Because if the baby is not breathing, then what happens is that um, with some positive pressure, the ventilator inflates the baby's chest, airflow or gas flow goes in and that creates a volume. Uh, it's almost like if, if it happens consistently, you can almost like a, you can almost write a mathematical function to make that. Um, in real life babies do breed because nowadays we don't sedate babies completely and that results in a kind of ventilator patient interaction with highly variable pressures, volumes and flows, which is not for the babies. So so actually, patient ventilator interactions are the ones which actually make mechanical ventilation complex. Um, four years ago, approximately four years ago, I started to download, I managed to get a cable which downloads data from, uh, from the ventilators we use on our babies, and I started to download data um, with high, or high sampling rate. So the, High sampling rate means 100 per second, which allows me to rebuild these waveforms, the pressure, flow, and volume waveforms, and, and also take like the ventilator parameters derived by the ventilator's computer with one, one hertz um, sampling rate. So these are the volumes and pressures and extra oxygen which goes in. And I started to download this data, and these data are streaming through a cable to a serial port as time series data with millisecond timestamp and, and they are written into nice CSV files. And, and I started to do that and I collected quite a lot of data and um, over the last four years I've collected approximately 700 days worth of, of, of ventilator data from over 100 infants and, and that is not unstorable, it's 500 gigabytes of data. But it's quite a lot of data, and, and the more of a problem is that uh, the 100 hertz data produce like over 6 billion data points. 
Now, uh, you need to understand that I'm a doctor, I'm a clinician, so I did, I was some, sort of, I, as a hobby, I was learning Python before, but once I got hold of this data set, I immediately realized that I won't get, won't get past Excel using the, <laughs> using to analyze this data, and I also was quite aware of the limitations of Excel, which we actually heard in the last plenary <coughs> session. And, and I um, studied Python and the data packages further, and, and, and actually was immediately useful for, for this data. And when you have a new tool and you use a new kind of data, you first ask always the simplest question, and then you're moving from, from which haven't been satisfactory answered yet. And I move, I've been moving from simple to more complicated questions. So the first questions I asked was very basic questions, which, I, as I think, was not actually, were not answered properly. As, and how ventilators perform? Do they really do what the manufacturers think they do, and we as clinicians think they do? and in real life situation when attached to babies and then in bench models. And the second question is how as clinicians we should set the ventilators to ensure normal blood gases, which is what we are actually aiming for and also the baby being comfortable on the ventilator. And I managed to publish a couple of papers about this, uh, but these are more like the low hanging fruits and actually the long term aim of, of my project is more like um, detect and quantify different ventilator-patient interactions, uh, adverse and, harm, and uh, beneficial and harmful, and, and also because of the complexities of ventilation and because how busy clinicians are, to develop some, some simple uh, numerical indices of how well the baby was interacting with the ventilator and, and uh, over longer periods, so that people don't miss out on this information unless they keep watching the ventilator for hours. And, and that task actually requires to segment this time series, this continuous time series data into individual ventilator inflations uh, so that we can study those inflations in isolation and, and do how the baby was interacting with the ventilator during those inflations. And this is uh, when I'm going to hand it over to David who has actually did some quite a lot of useful work on this and is going to present this data. Hi, so yeah, I'm David, I'm a medical student who was working with um, Dr. Beltanke. So basically about a year ago, um, Dr. Beltanke presented this problem to me and my background is primarily in genomics, so I don't actually work with signals very much. So I thought this would be like a um, chance for me to explore a different kind of data. So just to define the problem a bit more, this is um, the flow plot from one inflation. So positive on the y-axis represents in, inflowing air into the baby, and then negative flow is breathing out. So this is um, like a typical uh, inflation that um, is, is seen in a baby. And I just wanted to also define like several sub-phases. So the goal was to segment it in uh, the time series into individual inflations, but also to be able to look at how long um, each part of the inflation takes. So I divided each of these into um, four, four segments. So basically, the start of the inflation for, for inspiration, um, then a peak or a plateau, and then the termination, and then followed by um, the pause in between like your inspiration and expiration. So not all of these phases are always present, sometimes they may be absent, but it's, these are just uh, there for definition. So the same is done for uh, expiration as well. And um, the, same, the same thing was done for pressure as well, so I just look at the pressure waveforms and I just divide it into four, four sub-phases as well. So I'm just going to be talking about what the approaches that I did. So um, as with any data, it's not very clean all the time. So there's missing data and then you have your timestamps getting messed up and, and all those things. So um, I started by just assuming that the data that comes in is in uh, chronological order. So I sort of ignore the timestamps. Um, and for missing data, I interpolated um, using linear interpolation. and. Um, there's sometimes drift in the signal because there are leaks in the ventilation, so it's not always centered around zero flow or pressure. So uh, I just did some very basic uh, 
baseline correction using Windows. Um, and then the subsequent points is um, outlining um, basically my, the plan that I had, which was to segment the um, time series and identify um, the subphases, and then using that as features to see if I can um, un like summarize certain breaths in a period of time, or, or uh, can I classify breaths as initiated by the baby or the ventilator. So um, I tried a couple of approaches. So the first approach was using a spectral approach. So um, I used a package called PyWaveLab to use um, continuous wavelet transform, um, as, and then I used um, HMM learn to try and use uh, HMMs to label the data as well. And um, after that, I also used like, a window average and standard deviation method. Um, so the issue with all of this is that there wasn't any labeled data, so I was just working with like, a rough idea of like what a breath actually is, and that, that can be quite variable. So um, starting with the, the wavelet approach, um, basically this is the heat map of um, the wavelet transform on the flow data. So on your uh, on your y-axis you have the scale, and on the um, on the x-axis is translation across time. So x the x-axis is sort of like across time, and the scale is um, um, just adjusting the the wavelet template to uh, to different sizes to like see, and it just generates like a grid of coefficients and. Um, I basically just interpret it as um, you can see there are hot spots and cold spots on the heat map, and this roughly corresponds to like the different phases of um, inflation. So I thought that I could use this if I pick the right coefficient level to to uh, identify key points in the in the flow data. So if you look look at this graph, the green line represents the actual flow data and the blue line represents the, the coefficients for a particular level that I, I picked. And you can see that if you choose the right like, coefficient level, it, it sort of coincides with the starting of the breath, the peak, and so on. So using these peaks and thresholding, you can actually um, identify um, the points on the flow data and then start to like, use rules to segment the data to um, individual breaths. So um, that, that was the advantage of it, but however, there's some intrapatient variability as well as interpatient. So you can't really stick to the same coefficient level the whole time. Like sometimes for different patients, a different um, level of coefficient would be more suitable. So then that pushes the problem back with like how do you automatically decide which level to use. And because I was using the continuous wavelet transform, it was also a very slow running time. So an option would be that I could switch to a discrete wavelet transform instead. Um, and also because there was the rules of using like the upward facing peaks and downward facing peaks, and I still needed to draft like quite a lot of rules to actually segment the data properly. Um, then moving on to the Hiller Markov model approach, uh, this would actually have been my favorite approach because it was very simple in the sense that you could use an unsupervised uh, method to just train it on, on the data and it will roughly get the points for you. So um, initially I used a uh, hidden Markov model with three states and it was a fully connected uh, hidden Markov model. And you can see that the, the blue line uh, corresponds to the state. So roughly the state of zero is like the it, the pauses in between the, the inflations, uh, two is an inflation and one is a deep, is an expiration, um, but it's not particularly accurate, um, and you, especially when in the expiration phase it trails off, because uh, cause the expiration is extended, then it thinks that it's in a, a state like a inter in between inspiration and expiration but actually um, the expiration had lasted much longer than that. Um, so, yeah, I, this would have been my favorite approach because of the sim simplicity, but again, <coughs> it wasn't particularly accurate, and also if I wanted to identify sub-phases and like, in, like add more states into the HMM, then the training time started to increase quite a lot. Um, so the last method I approached was that I just divided the time series into small windows um, and then I calculated the average and standard deviation for each of these windows. 
and then using um, a couple of rules like if the difference between the averages was more than two standard deviations or something, and the and the magnitude of the difference between the averages, you can sort of uh, sort of classify it like whether this is the inspiration starting, is the expiration starting, and so on. So you can see I have six states here which correspond to each of these. Um, so overall, I think the main advantage of this was that the computation time was much faster, and given how much data Dr. Beltanki gave me, um, I felt that this was the best approach to go through all the data. And also, there's the problem of I defining what a breath actually is, because you usually have, you think a typical breath has like one inspiration, one expiration, but, um, to, but because of patient ventilator interaction, sometimes you can have sort of like a half inspiration during your expiration and then that just kind of messes up the idea of like what it actually is. Um, so because it's rule based then you can sort of like add these uh, exceptions in more easily or like adjust it to match the uh, what you're trying to find. Um, and then the disadvantages would be like basically a loss of resolution because of the windowing effect. Um, and also, again, it's probably inflexible and in incorrect for cases which are like, not accounted for. Um, so this is an example of an individual breath that, breath that was labeled using the window average and standard deviation approach. Um, so you can see that it's sort of getting most of the key points correctly. Um, and I'm just going to move on to the, the applications that we try. Um, oh yeah, oh, I also uh, just wrote a basic graphical tool to label and visualize the, the outputs. Um, yeah, so this, this is the application where I tried to use the length of the subphases as well as a couple of other features that I defined to sort of cluster like, the breaths over a period of time. So this is five minutes. There are about 200 different breaths here. Um, and you can see that even just using like the length of time that I spend each subphase, um, you can sort of start to see like different kinds of breaths already. So I don't know if you can really see it clearly, but um, the two um, the two uh, clusters up here, which are very similar, uh, are basically the example where um, there's an inspiration during expiration um, because. Like that's the initial inspiration, but then the expiration phase is interrupted by an individual inflation there. And those are uh, ventilator supported. So the yellow the yellow lines are like the pressure, the cyan lines are the flow, and then the the blue and red lines in the middle of them are sort of like the average of all the waveforms within that cluster. Um, so those are ventilator supported breaths, but then you can see that um, cluster one on the on the right is uh, breaths which are not supported by the ventilator at all. So those are just the uh, babies breathing uh, without any aid. Um, so normally I think you don't cluster waveforms using this, like you probably use like a Fourier transform or something and cluster them. But I guess if you did that, you would sort of lose the information which might be useful for clinicians, which is to like, un like understand how long each part of the breaths take. Um, yeah. um, and the last application that we tried was to um, identify whether breaths were initiated by uh, the baby or the ventilator. Um, so a synchronized inflation is one where the baby starts to breathe first and the ventilator detects that the baby is breathing so it kicks in and tries to support the baby. Whereas the backup inflation is the baby is not breathing at all but then the ventilator forces uh, the baby to breathe. So normally I think clinicians will set a certain rate like a baby needs to breathe a certain number of times in a minute uh, just so that they can get enough oxygen. So then the question is like what, what rate is suitable for the baby? So by identifying like how how many of each breath are synchronized versus backup, you can start to get an idea of um, what rate you should probably be setting. And um, if you look at the graph on the right for synchronized inflation, 
the blue line is the, the flow from the baby and the pressure, the orange line is pressure. So you can see here that um, the baby has started breathing in first and then the pressure is as a lag. So the pressure is dipping before it starts to increase. So using the labeled states from the, the tool that we made, like you can just do a simple check of like whether the pressure started rising first or whether the, um, the flow started rising first and that's just a very simple way to like classify breaths into like backup or synchronized I guess. Um, yeah. So that's a quick summary of what I've been working on. So I think we've made a decent step at uh, automatically segmenting the breaths in in the in, in terms of flow and identifying subphases as well. Um, and these these the length of each subphase can also be used to like cluster these inflations like decently. Um, yeah, and but I, I guess there's still a lot more work to do because. Um, Basically, all of this is not validated because there has not been any labeled data set. So that's why I, I, I wrote the graphical tool to um, let clinicians start to label the waveforms so that I can have some labeled data to like, calculate accuracy and things like that. Um, and I think once we have the labeled data, we can also start to re-explore like, um, the hidden Markov models too, and other techniques which like requires label data to train them, I guess. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's still some time for one question. Does anyone have a question to ask? Just about the label data, are you planning to collect more things about like the health state of the patient? So it's like you could relate the forms of the wave with some kind of disease or something. So these are these ventilator waveforms are typical data which clinicians recognize when they see. So that's why the ventilators actually show them real time. They show that this is the inflation when the ventilator started and the baby was breathing out when the ventilator was breathing in. So patient, clinician, it needs clinical knowledge and, and clinicians perhaps using the GUI David Develop need to uh, generate these, these, these annotations. And this could be perhaps used to validate the, the algorithm. And these are not good for the baby. So the baby, baby doesn't like to breathe against the ventilator. There are known physiological side effects of that. And in general, ventilator patient asynchrony is associated with poor neurodevelopmental outcome. For another question. How will you feed this back? Like, if you get the data and the CSV, if you want to know the baby's not breathing properly, it's getting forced to breathe or something, how could you? use that for clinicians, how can you tell them? So what I'm doing at the moment is that I'm creating data from babies who had ventilator days, several days, and then we have got review sessions when we discuss what was the ventilation like, and then what was good, what went well, what didn't go well. But it would be so much better to have uh, some sort of numerical indices, which uh, then, then immediately are shown to the clinicians, and they can then know, okay, in the last 12 hours, uh, why I'm still ventilating the baby. Things are not going so well. Any more questions? Yeah? Would you consider open sourcing, you know, the data that you collected so other people can play with it? You know, give them their insights? Maybe. Um, well, with regards to the data, I think there are issues with like patient confidentiality, like whether you can actually release the data freely. Um, that I'm probably not suited to answer that because the data comes from. Like, so, so we can, you know, um, we can de-anonymize the data to some extent uh, to be into pressure and flow. Mm -hmm. Uh, which at one point perhaps with a data sharing agreement we could release, but we will definitely want to publish this data first before we release data to others. But once we publish it, I think 
with data sharing agreement, we probably would be able to release data to named investigators without uh, the identified and with, with no patient identified identified with later. Thank you all for your questions, um, Gustav and maybe we'll be around the conference, so if you want to ask more questions, thank you all for coming and give them a big hand.